So welcome. Um, it's so nice to have all of you here tonight. Um, I want to welcome you to this forum. This forum is brought to you by really um, the district has a partnership with Chinatown Service Center. And they have allowed us through that partnership to partner with the PTAs of all the different five schools to bring you five different talks that we're going to have over the next few months. So this is our first one. It's called, It's All About Communication, Learning About Communication Styles. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but we have Nancy Ho and Brian Yao, and I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen. I'm going to share my screen and we can get started. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I really appreciate that all of you, you know, came out of your busy schedules to spend this hour with us. I'm really going to try to keep it in that time because just like y'all, I've got kids at home. I prepped dinner. Hopefully they're eating it and I'm going to go back and clean up afterwards. <laughs> so do you want to keep our time, keep track of our time? But um. I want to tell you a little bit about the Family Matters Workshop and where it came from first, and that's we partnered with San Marino Unified School District, and they really wanted us to come and do some family work um, for their schools. And so what we started was this Family Matters Workshop that was actually an in-person workshop with various families, and it's a 10-session workshop, and we actually are winding down. We're at our seventh session. We've had a lot of families that came out in person. It's a very interactive workshop. We play a lot of games. We have a lot of discussions with the children and the parents. It's been really amazing. Um, I know that for South uh, Pasadena, we're trying to modify it because it sounds like the this sort of webinar Zoom format would probably cover a lot more ground and more families could be able to attend. Um, but I this is kind of where it came from. And there's a lot of schools that have like more interest. And um, if anyone is interested in doing anything in person, um, you can always let Kristen know and we can always work something out too. But that's what we have right now and that's where it kind of came from. Um, so, okay, so a little bit about myself and then I'm going to let uh, my uh, fellow coworker Brian introduce himself as well. But my name is Nancy Ho. I am a LMFT. I'm the Director of Clinical Training at Chinatown Service Center. Um, I'm 12 years post-licensed, so I've been working in this field for a really long time. I've worked both in community mental health and private practice. I'm back here at community mental health doing a lot of just clinical training work, supervision. I love what I do. I'm very passionate about families. I focus primarily on API families, though, because I think that's um, a subgroup that needs um, a lot of like exposure to mental health. I think that there's in all in all. Um, I think there's just this stigma that that is in mental health sometimes that we at Chinatown Service Center is trying really hard to break through. So that's why we're doing all these workshops. We're really trying to engage families and let them know like, hey, there there's just a lot of fun aspects about this and it's not scary at all. And there's a lot of good information. So hopefully you guys learn something and have a lot of questions um, that you want to ask. I'd be feel free to try to answer them the best that I can. But I, I don't know everything, but I'll try my best. So um I love Bulba. I have two kids. I have a dog, um, two girls, and we're in LAUSD. I, I'm, I would love to be in South Pasadena, but I live on the west side because it's a lot cooler. <laughs> but um, I do love Pasadena. My brother and my sister-in-law live out there, and, and I love visiting them. So that's a little bit about me, and I will give it over to Brian. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian. Um, I am in I'm an associate marriage and family therapist at Chinatown Service Center. Um, and I've been practicing for three years now in multiple settings. Um, so I started out working at a high school and middle school. So I really love working with um, adolescents. Um, I also have experience working in private practice and now I'm in community mental health. Um, I provide service in English, Mandarin and Cantonese. Um, I was actually born in Canada, raised in Hong Kong. So um, just having that cultural experience really helps me to um, work with clients with like multiple cultural experiences as well. So that's my um, my passion. Um, I've also been working with like parents and particularly like working with young adults, helping them to, um, you know, uh, explore their identities. Um, so that's just a little bit about um, my expertise and my experience. And I'm just very excited to be doing this um, presentation with all of you guys. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah, of course. Thanks. 
All right, this is a quick table of contents. Um, we're going to talk about different styles of communication. I'm going to go through those styles, talk a little bit about that, and then um, conflict resolution. How do we go through that? Okay, quick look at the four styles of communication. Okay, um, there's aggressive communication, passive communication, passive aggressive, and assertive communication. Okay, so when we talk about the styles of communication, though, there's I, I want to talk about how this isn't necessarily like how you communicate regularly on, you know, just talking to your friends or um, your children. It's really focused on um, conflict. How how do you communicate when there's conflict or when you're angry? Because I think all of us have pretty good communication, but the breakdown happens when we have conflict or when we're upset that we might revert to one of these styles of communication. So I just want to put it out there because I don't want anyone to be like, what, this, I'm a great communicator, you know? And I think um, as I go through them, you might kind of like be like, okay, I kind of recognize what, what Nancy's talking about. So the first one is aggressive communication. And what does that look like? So it basically means like when you're, when you're in conflict or when you're upset, you're demanding, um, an aggressive communicator is demanding their way regardless of the feelings or rights of others. Um, you may be hurtful emotionally or physically. You yell, swear, belittle others. Um, and then afterwards, you might say, oh, sorry, I was just like in a bad mood. I wasn't thinking. I, I wasn't thinking clearly. I don't know what I was doing. So examples of actual phrasing that you might hear from an aggressive communicator might be like, this is your fault, or it's my way or the highway, or do what I say. I don't care what you have to say. You never do anything right. I don't agree with you, so I don't have to listen to your opinion. Um, finger pointing, crossing your arms, eye rolling, because communication isn't just the words that you say. It's also your, your body language, the tone of voice. All of that um, is a type of aggressive communicator. All right. So here's just a quote. Um, the biggest difference between being assertive and being aggressive is how your words and behaviors affect the rights and well-being of others. And I like this quote because to be honest, I think a lot of times people mix the two things up together. They're saying like, well, I was just being assertive. Okay. Like I, I was just trying to assert myself and my feelings. But I think there's that fine line that you, we're gonna talk a bit later about what assertive communication is, but that aggressive communication affects the rights and well-beings of other people. Okay, so the next form of communication is passive communication. So a passive communicator holds their feelings, they avoid the issues. They may not even realize that they're angry because they're using anger avoiding strategies like cutting, binge eating, apathy, helplessness. So they might not actually feel that they're angry because they're doing these other activities. Um, and they usually don't get what they want and they give in easily. So common examples of passive, a passive communicator, they're always apologizing when they're asking for something that they need. Um, they might say, oh, I guess there's just nothing I can do about it. They might sigh really loudly. They might say like, oh, I wish someone could remember to buy milk, you know, passively saying that. Um, they might say, I guess that's fine, whatever. Um, we'll do whatever you want. They might use self-deprecating language like, oh, this, you know, this is all my fault. I, I'm I'm a loser. I, I'm the one who's doing things wrong. Um, they might have meager behavior and speech, um, expressing a lot of guilt when communicating needs, and then giving to others opinions and suggestions, giving into others opinions and suggestions, and frequent indecisiveness. Okay. So peace has to be created. In order to be maintained, it will never be achieved by passivity and quietism. And I think I picked this quote because I think sometimes um, being passive doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. But I think what we're trying to say that if you want to make something happen, sometimes being passive isn't the best method. Um, so then we're moving to the third form of communication, which is passive aggressiveness. So this type of communicator doesn't deal directly with the situation um, or the person that makes them angry. So instead, they might be like, okay, I'm not mad at you, but then they'll express their anger by gossiping, stealing, or vandalizing. 
Um, they may give people the silent treatment. They may be critical. They may be sarcastic. They may follow up being rude by saying, oh, but I was just kidding. You know, that was just a joke. Um, they may agree with you to avoid an argument, but then their actions later might be harmful. So they might be like, okay, whatever you want, but then later on, they'll do something that's harmful to get back at the person. Okay, so examples of passive aggressive communication would be, oh, why are you being so sensitive? Or why are you getting upset? No offense, but this. They might say, oh, I thought you knew that I was going to do this. Um, your work is surprisingly good. Um, if that's what you want to do, or that's great, but it's almost as nice as this. So that's that type of passive aggressive communication. Passive aggressive aggression is the silent assassin of healthy communication. I love this quote because I think it really sums it up. I think um, passive aggressiveness is a type of communication that I see a lot. And I think when someone is passive aggressive, it really ends communication and positive communication between two people. The last one we want to talk about, which is what I think is the best form of communication, the one that we all want to strive towards, is assertive communication. So it's you stand up for the right, their rights, but you also respect the rights of others. And that, that's that piece where you can be assertive in what you want, but you're also respecting the rights of other people and you're not just being aggressive about it. You express your feelings in a non-blaming and non-threatening way. You listen to others. You make your requests clear and specific. I'd say that this is the biggest key when we talk about assertive communication. I think a lot of times what we do is we kind of think we can um, think that the other person can, can read our minds. And when they can't and they do something that we don't like or that we didn't want, we get upset. But if you learn to be clear in what you want and to be specific, then you don't run into that miscommunication that often happens with like passive aggressive behavior or even passive behavior. So um, an assertive person gets what they want, but it's also through negotiating and compromising. And I think that's a big key here. So an example of assertive communication is more like, oh, I feel this, you name the feeling when whatever it is that happened, um, and then you would actually be specific with what you need and what you want. And you stick to the facts. When you're having a communication, you're sticking to the facts. In your own body language, you maintain eye contact, uncrossed arms, open demeanor, showing interest. You're not just shut down and waiting for your turn to speak. You maintain a calm tone. And I know that can be hard when you're in conflict, but you're gonna be positive. You're gonna frame things in a positive manner. And there's going to be no criticism of yourself or others. And that's what we're really focusing on, assertive communication here. Now, um, here's another quote, which is, assertiveness is your ability to act in harmony with your self-esteem without hurting others. I love this quote. I'm going to say it one more time. Assertiveness is your ability to act in harmony with your self-esteem without hurting others. And I think that's really that's a really hard thing to do, but I hope that we can really strive for that because... Um, we're talking about how passivity, passive aggressiveness, and aggressiveness, that style of communication often leads to hurting others or ignoring your own self. And when we talk about assertive communication, we're really trying to um, respect yourself and your needs, but also respecting other people and not hurting them. So it's a good harmony there. Okay, so this is a question, opening it up to the chat. Um, what type of communication style? I think everyone here is a parent. I don't, I don't see any kids on here, but what type of communication style do you recall your family of origin had? When you think about it, when you were a child, what type of communication did you see your parents have? Your mom, your dad? If you feel comfortable, I'd love for people to put that in the chat. Anybody? <laughs> Anyone brave enough to put in chat? I think there's a way you could put it like anonymously. Yelling style, silent treatment, passive from both parents, passive aggressive, aggressive, passive, passive aggressive. I'm seeing a pattern here too. Um, for me, I'll share that my my mom definitely had uh, passive aggressive communication, and my dad was very passive. Um, and so I think that was the way that I was raised in, in my family environment. And I remember like 
thinking sometimes like, oh, um, I'd ask like, am I allowed to do this? And then my mom would be like, oh, ask your dad, you know? And then I asked my dad and my dad's like, well, you should ask your mom. <laughs> and I went to go ask my mom and she'd be like, so your dad said to ask me? And I'm like, yeah. And so she's like, okay, well then this is my answer. And it was just this like back and forth and really um, difficulty in understanding who was in charge and who wasn't in charge. And um, I think for me, uh, that was a very confusing time for me. And so I'm seeing a, here a lot of passive aggressive behavior, aggressive one parent, passive another parent. That's actually a very common pattern that you'll see if one um, parent is aggressive and the other one is passive. I really appreciate that you guys shared this. So when you think about the types of communication style you grew up with and what you saw, I want you to now ask yourself, what communication style do you have? Um, if you guys are willing to put that in the chat, what do you, what type of communication style do you think you have? And I think you can be honest with yourself. Like I would say that I grew up as a younger uh, daughter in an API family with an older brother. I definitely had more passive communication and then sometimes bordering on passive aggressive. As I became older, I feel like now um, I distinctly remember this time I had with my dad when I was in my 20s where he got really upset at me and, and I felt like he was unfairly upset. And usually I would have thrown a tantrum, gotten really mad at him too, or walked away, had some passive aggressive behavior. But I had this light switch that turned on me. And I was like, I remember I was like 23 at the time. It was very calm. And I said to my dad, when you act like that, I can't respect you. And he, this is like from an API, he's first generation you know, I'm second generation, you don't talk like that to your parents. And I remember like, he was shocked, he was like silent. And I was like, I can't believe I just said that to my dad, no screaming, no yelling, very calm. And he turned around and walked out, came back again. And he said, you know what, you're right. And I'm going to apologize to you for that behavior. And he never lost his temper like that again. And it's been 20 years since that day. And I remember it was just I couldn't believe that I actually had that type of conversation with my dad, first of all, because we didn't talk like that. My dad's the kind of person that doesn't say two words, you know? Um, and I think I encourage all of my students, everyone that I come in contact with, especially from API families, that you can change the way you communicate with your parents, even when you're in your 20s, even when you're in your 30s, even when you're in your 40s. Just takes one person to change that communication style that you can decide I'm going to change how I communicate with my dad. And it actually works. It can change how they communicate with you. So um, did anyone put in their communication style? Let's see. Used to be passive, but with therapy turned assertive. Love that. Um, used to be more passive aggressive, now more assertive. Unless I'm having a bad day, completely agree with that one. We can't always be perfect. 100% assertiveness. Um, mix of all of them, depending on the situation. I love this. I really appreciate that you guys are doing that. Same as my parents, unless I'm conscious. I know sometimes we have to be consciously assertive. You know, sometimes we all have our bad days or we're tired and we're cranky. Um, and I think this works not just with our families, but even in our place of work. How to be assertive with our bosses, with our fellow coworkers. I think that's hard sometimes, but it's something that we have to practice. Um, I appreciate everything that everyone put in here. So we're going to now talk about, well, like, what can we do? What are What are the styles how do we practice assertive communication in real life? And here I'm going to pass it over to Brian to talk about conflict resolution and some tips and tricks that he can give you guys. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Um, so for the next portion on conflict resolution, I just want to preface that conflict is not necessarily a bad thing. It is an opportunity to negotiate, to discuss, to communicate your needs. Just like Nancy's example, when she practiced assertive communication, when there's a conflict, it actually um, was an educational opportunity for both her parent and herself, right? Um, and it changed the whole the whole system, the way that um, the family communicates. Um, so let's not shy away from conflicts, but um, we get to choose how we want to handle conflicts. And um, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the way that we communicate is so important. 
Um, and we know that assertive communication uh, is a clear way of communicating your needs, um, letting other people know um, how they can um, respect you and, um, and uh, you know, yeah, interact in a better way. So one of the things that we can do is uh, to use iMessages. And I, I believe that a lot of us have heard of this. Um, and so iMessage basically is uh, a way of like owning up to our own um, feelings, our perceptions, our thoughts, and we're not going to um, attack or use aggressive communication. We're not going to uh, put the blame on the other person, but first of all, owning to uh, our experience, owning up to our own experience. I will go, it will, it will include these elements, um, describing uh, the behavior, right? Um, the feelings that the behavior created, and then the, the effect that the behavior has. So um, if you look at the, the picture on the right, um, there are these elements, four components. I feel, like I feel upset because I was left at home by myself, right? What I need is um, for, you know, my mom to be there or what I, yeah, or something like that. Or here's an example on the left. Um, I feel hurt because I didn't get to make a choice. I feel overworked and would really appreciate some extra help. I feel misunderstood and it makes me feel upset, right? So you communicate your feelings and then you make a suggestion um, you also back up your feelings with evidence, right, as a way to help the other person to understand how you feel. All right. Okay. Um, here are some examples. Okay, so if you look at uh, the statement where it says blaming, let's look at the one on the left. It says, you can't keep coming home so late. It's so inconsiderate, right? So that's a form of finger pointing, right? Um, what do you think would happen if you finger point at someone? Um, so normally people will become defensive, right? Because you're basically putting the blame entirely on that person. Um, you're, and it could be perceived as a form of attack, right? But the perception would change if you're using I statements. For example, I feel worried when you come home late. I can't even sleep. And you're letting the other person know how their behavior has impacted you, their feelings, and then um, your reaction to their behaviors. And then another example is, you never call me, I guess we just won't talk anymore, right? That is a form of um, passive aggressive communication. Yeah, I, we won't talk anymore, right? It is a way of guilt tripping, right? Um, so if we were to change it to an I statement, you can say, I feel hurt when you go so long without calling. I'm afraid you don't care, right? You're, you're, again, you're communicating your need. I want you to care if you can call me, okay? All right, so let's look at, let's practice a bit. Um, so take a look at scenario one, and I'm gonna give everyone like a couple, maybe like 20 seconds to think about this. Um, a friend always cancels plans at the last minute. Recently, you were waiting for them at a restaurant when they called to say they couldn't make it. So how would you present it if you were to use iMessage? And if you want to, please type it in the chat. would love to hear some responses. So again, state the behavior, um, state how the behavior impacted you, right? And how you feel. So um, maybe I can give it a shot. Um, <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> That's a very assertive way of communicating. I feel upset when you cancel last minute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the focus is placed on your feeling, not so much on what the other person did, right? I feel like our friendship isn't important to you when you don't give me a sufficient heads up about a change in plans. Great. That's a great way of communicating assertively, right? Um, you can communicate your needs, 
your feelings without shying away. Um, and it opens an opportunity for you guys to talk about like what can be done better next time. When you cancel plans on me last minute, it makes me feel like you don't value my time. Yeah. Um, so yes, that is also considered an I statement. If you can also include like, I feel that would be um, even better. Um, I feel like you don't value our friendship when you cancel last minute. I hope that you can give me at least some more notice. Yes. Yeah. And you're offering a solution as well. I feel hurt when plans get canceled. I need friends who are consistent, not perfect. Right. These are great responses. Um, let's take a look at scenario two. So you're working on a group project and one member is not completing their portion. You have repeatedly had to finish um, their work. So if I were to make this into an I message, I would say, I feel upset that I have to absorb most of the responsibility for the group project, right? There was no finger, po finger pointing. Um, you're just stating the reality that I had to absorb um, most of the work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by stating this, the person hopefully will uh, build more of an empathy knowing that, knowing your perspective, right? And it opens an opportunity to discuss, again, um, what went wrong, um, or was there any miscommunication, misunderstanding, and what can be done in the future, all right? Okay, let's move on. Um, I want to introduce to you this acronym called TALK, all right? Um, and TALK is a way of, uh, it's kind of similar to uh, iMessage, um, but also offers more of a solution. Um, T stands for tell the person what happened and what you saw and thought about it, right? State just facts. This is what happened. Um, this is my perception, right? And we know that perception is not necessarily reality all the time, but your perception is still valid. So let the other person know your perception, your feeling. And then A stands for admitting to your part of your responsibility in this situation. L is listening to the other person's story, repeat back what they said to make sure you understand. So we wanna practice active listening as well, because again, your side of the story may not be the complete story, right? Um, so uh, spend some time listening to what the other person have to say without interrupting immediately, um, and then repeat back so that you're showing that you're on the same page and you understand where that person is coming from. And K, well, this is not necessarily a K word, collaborate, um, but phonetically still a K. Um, collaborate on a solution, work together, addressing needs and wants, be specific. So this is ultimately what we want to arrive at with conflict resolution, um, is to collaboratively find a solution, to find a compromise, um, a way that works for the both of you. Um, so, Hope this is helpful. Um, I know I'm this gonna, is what the, huh? Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something really quick about this talk acronym. One part that I really want you guys to pay attention to is L, which is listen to the other person's story and repeat back what they said to make sure you understand. Because here, I don't know how many people here come from um, families that are of uh, different generations that come from different cultures, but we work with so many families where they're not speaking the same language even. Like you've got parents whose uh, native language is a different language and you've got children whose native language is English. And that's kind of like the way I grew up too. Ours is even more confusing because we speak like Taiwanese, Mandarin and English. So sometimes I speak all three in a single sentence. Um, and it's it's very confusing even for my parents and they they do the same thing back to me. And so I think what we've learned in working with so many families of multicultural, like generational, even language is that, and I swear this is true, that sometimes when we actually have families do this, the kids and the parents, they don't even understand what they're actually saying. When they actually repeat back, oh, this is what you're saying, right, mom? And they're like, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm actually saying this. And so that's like a really big key here. 
when you are talking intergenerationally, because even the language that you use um, is used differently. It, you know, like my parents may use one word one way, but I actually am interpreting that a different way, whether it's in Chinese or whether it's English, because we just like are a different generation as well. And so I think when we always ask parents and children when they're doing together, we do a lot of family work and we say, OK, what do you think your mom just said? Repeat back what your mom just said. And then they'll say it in their own words. And then they're like, no, that's not what I said. That's not what I meant. And then same with vice versa. When we have the parents say, what do you think your son just said? And they said, well, he said this. And the son's like, no, that's not what I said. That's not what I meant. And it's both just like actual language. And it's also communication. It's it's a mixture of both. So I understand that when we work with families that are like um, speaking like literally different languages as their native tongue, there's so much room for miscommunication. And so there's actually, um, unfortunately, what you guys aren't able to do because we're virtual, but there is a game that we play with families and it's so eye opening. What it is, is they we have them sit back to back and they they have one person has a picture of it, like it's kind of like a um, figure and then they're going to describe it to the other person to draw. Now, when they're describing it, they that other person can't ask any questions. They have to just listen to the description and then they draw it. And then when we show it, it's inevitably very, very different than what the actual picture is. And then we do it again, but this time the, the person can ask questions. So you imagine the parent is the one describing the picture and now the child can ask questions. They can say, oh, is the circle the size of a quarter? Or is the circle the size of a dime? Oh, is it located on the corner? Or is it located on the bottom? And it's such an eye-opening experience for parents to see that when you allow your children to ask lots of questions or vice versa, that it allows deeper communication because they're clarifying things. They're asking questions saying, oh, is it this big? Is it this small? Is it green? Is it blue? Those clarifying questions improve communication so much. And that's really what this second part is to be able to like clarify things. And that it only takes that if you actually repeat back what you think the person said. So I really wanted to highlight that. You know, we're like, I really want to leave a big chunk of this time for Q&A. So this is kind of like, I could talk on this subject for another 25 minutes, but I don't want to. I actually want to leave this open to Q&A because this is our first talk. I want to know um, more about what families here in South Pasadena are going through, what they're interested in. Chinatown Service Center services a lot of families in the San Gabriel Valley, and we offer a lot of different services. And we see a lot of your kids. Honestly, we are in a lot of the schools, uh, elementary, middle, and high school. We see a lot of the kids from this area. Um, I know a lot of things that are happening uh, right now in, in, in the climate that we have. So what I'm opening it to Q&A right now. What are you guys interested in asking? And we can leave like this, the rest of this time really open to questions. Thank you. This is awesome. I love that game so much. It just I mean, uh... I could put it in the chat if you all want it. I'm going to put it in the chat. It's a PDF file. You guys can do it for fun if you'd like to. That'd be great. And also somebody asked if they, if we could get the uh, slides, I can post them when I post the video. Mm -hmm. I can um, do that. That'd be wonderful too. So um, please put your questions in the chat. If we have everybody's really quiet and, oh, here we go. Oh, here's one. Actually, before I ask this question, um, can you, Nancy, do you know much about the collaboration that South Pasadena School District has with Chinatown Service Centers and what other things we can access through you? Yeah, so what we have right now is we do have, um, we offer counseling services to any of the students um, at any of the schools. I believe, I, I, I can't say for certain which ones that we actually have space at, but it just, we could go to any schools as long as there's space. And it's free services to any child and any parent of the child. So you can get free therapeutic services through any of our counselors, um, either in our offices or at the school. It's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's such a great service and it's one of those we try as PTAs to get that information out to everybody, but it doesn't always get there until you're kind of desperate. So we want everybody to know about that. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. I do have one question. Um, how do you reply to someone who's passive aggressive? Do you use an I statement or? Just yeah. <laughs> you, you use an I statement. Exactly. You use assertive communication back to this person that's being passive aggressive. 
a lot of the times I think passive aggressive behavior gets responded with more passive aggressive behavior, to be honest, because it's kind of a natural thing that you have when someone's being passive aggressive, you be like, okay, yeah. And then you sort of like walk away because you're also being passive aggressive. But I guarantee you that if you practice assertive communication, it's a shocker because that's not the usual response. And we as counselors is something that's like, I continually train our student counselors and our um, clinicians on how to have more assertive communication because it's not that natural for us. We often mirror the type of communication that comes at us. Um, and so if you can not mirror it, but actually be like, I'm going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And it often shocks the person, you know? Yeah. And I want to say that oftentimes the person who uses passive aggressiveness doesn't really know that they are doing that. Um, like, for example, like my mom would say, like, if I make a comment, um, she would say something like, I'm the, like the worst mom ever. Right. And I, I could let that slide or I can actually talk to her about how that statement made me feel like, mom, that's not what I meant. Um, I was simply stating that this is how I feel. But when you um, like communicate passive aggressively, it makes me feel like I misunderstood or I'm wronged. Right. And that opens up um, a uh, an opportunity to talk about the communication. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like, again, like an educational opportunity for um, the other person as well. It's a great example. I think a lot of us, I have dealt with that. <laughs> so I understand. Um, so the next question is what if the passive aggressive person is a teacher and the student's afraid to speak up? How can we, you know, talk to our, our kids? Uh, talk? Yeah, that's, that's such a tough question because it's like a, um, such a power differential. And I wouldn't say that it's impossible. I, I'd say that if you can teach your student to your child to be, to like keep practicing that assertive communication. And so what we do with our students, our young people, is we literally role play. And I do that with my kids all the time. I do, I have younger, I have my younger daughter who's only eight. And we talk a lot about how to say no to someone um, because she's a people pleaser. And I'll be like, well, how do we say no if someone was really bothering you? If you were getting bullied by a boy and he's like pulling your hair, you know, what do you say? She's like, I don't know. I'd say no, stop that. And I'm like, you're going to say it like that? Is that you think he's going to listen if you say no, stop that? And I, I literally have her practice. No, you say it loud. You say it clear. And I tell her your throat is going to remember, it's called muscle memory, how to actually say it in that tone. You know, you're going you're, you're gonna to have that muscle memory. So we're going to practice saying it in that tone. So a lot of it is literally practicing how you're going to say it and what you're going to say until it becomes a little bit more natural when the, when the time actually comes. So that's what I actually would say is to teach your student, your child, like, how would we do it? How would you actually do it? And then you can role play a really mean teacher so that they're prepped for that possibility. And then maybe someone that's like a little bit more understanding and you can do a lot of things. I have, a, I do role play all the time with my clients. And I think that's very helpful. Um, I do want to answer that question by Holly about uh, to ask your sixth grade son to get him to open about his day at school. I think that's a very common question I get. I think the number one thing is, do you talk about your day? Do you say the things that you want your child to say to you? Um, because I think that's the key is to model. So like if you're going to ask 50 questions and it's going to become an interrogation, I think it's natural for people to shut down. But if you start sharing the way that you want your child to share, so if you share about your day and it's and it's more specific and it's actually more detailed and it's about your own feelings and about maybe what happened that's like interesting or not interesting, I think we want to model that type of behavior before we ask that behavior. And so I think like for me, I, I often do talk about my day with my kids too. I talk about my highs and my lows. I don't force them to share, but naturally I think like either they're tired of me talking all the time and they want to have a chance to talk, or I think that they're used to that way of conversing. And so it allows them, but I think sixth grade is also very tough. So don't give yourself some slack. You know, that there's going to be these dark days <laughs> when your kids from like six all the way until they're like 16 or 17 and there's going to be a lot of those dark days and there's and even though you're trying your best you're not going to get through and I think you have to cut yourself slack and I'll tell you back on the other side and when my mom can tell you too that when they get on that other side when they're in their 20s and they're just going to love you and be ashamed of all the ways that they treated you poorly <laughs> and you can wait for that day too um I would also say just as a parent of, of three older kids <laughs> wait until bedtime 
they'll tell you lots of things at bedtime. They don't want to go to bed. <laughs> my kids, my ninth grader comes in and like, I'm lying in bed. I'm basically ready to fall asleep. And he's like, so let's talk about what happened today. Mm-hmm. So that's always funny. <laughs> Okay, so the next question, um, how can we promote an open communication relationship with our younger kids, like elementary age? How, how can we establish a good foundation within our household in order to mirror the same communication when we're not there, like in a school situation? Yeah, I think like a lot of like, it's similar to what I was saying before, is that we ha- you have to practice. You have to practice what you want them to do, like even in real life, like with you. And I think also what I've done is have social situations that you can actually observe. So if you're not hosting play dates, especially for elementary kids, because I'll tell you, once they get older, you're not going to any play dates. You're not going to see what they're doing at play dates anymore. The younger your kids are, the more you have a little bit more control over seeing what happens. And the more they actually want you to be there, you're going to hit that window at 10, 11, 12, where you're not, you can't do that anymore, right? So if you've got kids below that 11 age, make those play dates happen at your house so you can observe how they are socially. And then you can then, you know, in gentle ways, be able to point out some of the things that you saw because, you know, your kids are going to come home and they're going to be like, oh, so-and-so was really mean. But I guarantee you, if you actually saw the interactions between your child and that those other children, you might be surprised by your own kid's behavior, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, I play it both ways. I'm not going to believe everything my kid says because I know that's not always going to be the truth. So the more you can actually um, see what's happening, I also volunteer a lot on campus because I want to see what's going on. And I know that's not the case for our parents. I'm a working parent too, but when I have a I have a day off that I can, I, I will try to find at least one or two times to volunteer in the quarter so I can see what's going on. Um, I think because you just have such a limited time to do that because there's going to be a time where they'll hate you if you're there. And so I think if you can do that, then you'll get the more information you have about the kids, the more power you have, to be honest. I always say that the devil's in the details. You can see if you can visually see what's going on, then you'll have a little bit more to go with. So I would say that like if you're younger kids, do the play dates, invite them to your house or go over to their home to the the play dates that you're getting invited to so that you can kind of observe those social situations and fine tune them. I hope that answered that question. I think that's great. That's exactly what I always did. So it's awesome. Um, I think you hit on this a little bit, but um, the question is, aside from leading by example, how do you teach or help a teen to stop aggressive communication style? Um, I know you were going to put one of the activities in the chat, but maybe- more that you can put in the chat to help with that too and games I can you know what because I actually for some reason this this chat isn't allowing me to upload documents there might have been like a like something that's on there and you know the setting so what I'll do is I'll email a file to you and you can post it up but I'll put some things up there um you know aggressive I I this is so hard because I'm seeing that you're right it's it is like an online um way of communicating that peers have because you're sort of like hidden you know what I mean? You're, it's easy to like be really mean online because there's no like, it's that kind of virtual feel to it. Um, I think activities, practices, and games, I think like partly it's also how, how you can um, help your teen distinguish good friendships and, and like good rules set for like online rules and behavior that you want to see them and I think part of that's also implementing like if you're not seeing like uh if you're seeing really aggressive language then maybe that has some consequence that you can do which probably has something to do with not being on the phone or taking away certain apps or something like that but for teens I feel like that's really tough because you gotta have to like be a little bit more assertive in the way that you manage um, the, their social media time and, and, you know, some consequences to certain behaviors. Um, it is tough. I think that's really hard with the influence of online. I think that anonymity makes us be really mean sometimes. So I get that. That's a tough one. Um, let's see. And the last one is what's your recommendation when your teen's screaming and cussing at you? Uh, I would recommend going to family therapy to do some conjoint work. I think the screaming and the cussing is coming from something. And that something is sometimes like hard for them to tell you, you know, whatever that could be. 
Um, and I think therapy sometimes allows, individual therapy allows teens to express themselves in a way that then like they can process. And then your therapist, what we do is we do individual therapy and then we do conjoint with the parents because first we're kind of building that trust with the teen to find out like, hey, what's going on? You know, like what's, where's this anger coming from? Um, and then we can bring in the mom and as you're sort of like the mediator for that conversation, I think it's very hard for a parent to be calm and collected the entire time your teen's cussing and screaming at you. I think in a situation where you have a mediator, I think that can help kind of like bridge whatever the the, the gap is that's happening. I, I do think that there there's something happening with our teens that we want to understand. And it's always not easy as a parent, but you can have that third person there to kind of like help you out. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. Just kind of aside to that, um, what do you do when your teen doesn't, is like, I'm not going to therapy, especially if they're pretty passive and they're just like, I don't want to meet a new person. I feel uncomfortable around new people. Why would I tell them what I'm thinking? Do you have any advice for what to say to them to try and convince them to go? Yeah, I mean, we've had some of that, but like, you know, what's really interesting is like, if you can get them to just come for one session, and I mean, like bribe and cajole maybe, but like, if you can get them to come to one session, I think they'll be pleasantly surprised because most of some of our even toughest teens, they'll come and it's, it's not what they think it is, is the point is when they actually come, it's usually not what they think is. Of course, there's been some teen who are like literally say nothing the entire time and, and it kind of freaks a therapist out. But if they can like stick through that, those teens will open up too. So it's sort of like they'll test your limits, but you're not a mom, you're not the teacher, you're this other entity that they've never experienced before that's saying like, you can tell me anything and I won't say anything. And that's a very powerful bond that you can have with somebody. Um, and I think that's what's a little bit different. Um, see another question. Yeah. What is your recommendation when your teen shuts up communication? Shuts up communication. So it's like the opposite, right? Of the other one. I think like um, when they're not talking to you at all, I do feel like it's the same thing. You know, it's just a different symptom for the same problem. So I think that's like the same recommendation for the previous one is to see if you can either get your child to come into services or maybe you come into services and find out what's going on. Um, a lot of the times I think for parents, like the more that you learn about yourself and about what's going on with your family, the more that can change the dynamic with your child. It kind of takes, it's a two-way street, you know, and I feel like, um, going into therapy was like the best thing for me personally, a lot of self-discovery. I think it's hard sometimes to have insight into things that's going wrong with yourself. It's easier to kind of see what's going wrong with everybody else. And I think change starts from one person. I've been doing family therapy for quite some time. And I say in a family of four, a family of five, it only takes one person. It doesn't even matter who that person is. It's usually not the identified patient, which is the child. It's usually somebody else. And it just takes that change to, to enact change in all five people. And that change could be you first, you know? It's fantastic. Um, I have no more questions. Um, so I think we'll just wrap it up here. Uh, this has been awesome and amazing and enlightening. And I appreciate, um, just so everybody knows, it'll take a day or two, um, but I will edit the video and get it up on our definitely the high school website. They might just, all the other schools might just share it from there. I'll get the flyers, the, all the recommended games that we can play with our kids. They'll probably, I want to play the one back to back just for fun. Um, <laughs> but uh, I will get that out to all the schools so they can get it out to you and we will see you all in a month.